Welcome to First Chapter Friday. My name is Lucy, and the book that I'm going to be reading the first chapter of today is called Gooseberry, and this is by Robin Gao. Gooseberry is the story of a 12-year-old named B. B has recently come out as non-binary, and so they are going by the letter B because they have not yet chosen what they want their name to be. They are also a child that has been living with many different foster families. They get moved around a lot, often because their foster parents don't understand them or they don't fit the mold that their foster parents are hoping that they will. What B wants, in addition to being able to find the right name for themselves, is to be a dog trainer. This is the thing that B is really focused on doing with their life. And so in order to do that, they need to get a dog and they wanna find a foster family that will allow them to get a dog. Serendipitously, they meet a dog named Gooseberry at a block party. While they're living with foster parents who are not very supportive of them and are not supportive of the idea of getting a dog. The next couple that B moves in with Erie, short for Wisteria, and Jody. They're much more accepting of both B and the idea of getting a dog. So I'm going to read chapter one of Gooseberry so we can get a little bit of B's story. Chapter one, the only way to really know how people feel about you is by eavesdropping. I love that there's such a poetic sounding word like eavesdropping for doing something you're not supposed to do. But how else are you supposed to know for sure? I've lived in five different foster homes, and each time, eavesdropping is the only way I've figured out what's going on. Now I live with Mandy and Rick, who smell like chicken broth and dead roses. I've been here six months, which is both a long time and a short time. They were nice at first, but isn't everyone nice at first? I waited a week before I asked for a dog, and they laughed and said, ha, ah, that's cute. I felt like the whole world was crashing down. I said, I'm not kidding. I'm going to be a dog trainer. That's when they stopped being nice. Rick said, I keep a clean home and dogs make everything dirty. You don't really want a dog anyway. You just want friends. I knew I didn't want to live here. I remember standing there, not sure what to say. I ended up not saying anything. That's what I always do with them, not say anything, because they'll just make me feel bad for asking. So it's kind of rare for me to argue about something, but I just feel exhausted today. I can't imagine surviving the block party they want to take me to. My head hurts, I say. Well, the fresh air will help, Mandy says. We're all standing in the kitchen. Mandy is holding out a bottle of sunscreen to me and says, put this on. I'm sick, I try. I'm not physically sick, but I feel drained in my brain. So I feel like that should count. You'll feel better. You wanted to go, Rick says. That's just totally not true. I never wanted to go. I feel out of options. Maybe if I'm honest, it'll work better. I say, all I want to do is draw or read manga. Mandy laughs. Oh, no, you don't. You just do that because you're being shy. Rick says, you're making yourself sad by not going. I look at their shiny glass table, big cupboard filled with what Rick calls his fine china, which I think is weird because it's not from China. Rick says, fine, China is just fancy plates. Mandy says, I'm disappointed in you for being so argumentative. I know you'd like it if you went. We're just trying to do things as a family. I don't know why they always say it's my fault whenever something isn't going right. Now I feel really bad though. I guess I can make myself go. I look at my reflection in the glass table when I ask, can I just grab my backpack and then we can go? I like to keep my backpack with me when I'm feeling really nervous. It's got some fidget toys in it and a bottle of water. My social worker, Di, helps me put it together. I think of turtles and how they hide in their shells, and I wish I could hide in my backpack. Mandy sighs. Fine, she says. We need to work on that, though. Rick says to Mandy, there are places we can't take a backpack. You can't always rely on that. I run up to my bedroom, which is in the attic and has lots of dead moths. It's got a lot of dust, but it's better than my room in the house before where I had three foster siblings and none of us got along. I call that the Bones house. They were all boys and then there was me. I'm not a boy or a girl really, but I do like some boyish things. I use they, them pronouns, but I can't get anyone but my friends to use them. My friend Clementine uses Z, their pronouns. And when Z tells people, most people, 
but especially adults, are like, what is that? Ugh, why are adults so not good at listening? I want to change my name because it feels too much like it's for a girl. The problem is that every name I come up with, I know people would assume is for a boy or a girl. Really, no name has to be only a boy name or a girl name, but people make assumptions. It's hard to imagine there's one that's just right for me. Then sometimes I'm like, maybe B is my name. B is the first letter of my old name, so it just feels easier to keep, but it still doesn't feel quite right. I go by B for now until I can figure out something else. Anyway, I call my foster home before this one the Bones House because the bones of the house were thin and all the boys were super loud and rowdy. Once I eavesdropped on my foster mom talking to my foster dad at the Bones House and she said, I don't know what to do with B if, and I couldn't make out the rest. I pressed my ear hard to the wall as if I might be able to like rewind real world sounds. I've been trying to fill in what she said on my own. I think... If they don't get their grades up, if they fail sixth grade, if they don't try to be a normal kid, if they don't start cleaning up after themselves, if they don't stop being so stupid, if they can't stop being a mess, I have invented a list that goes on forever. I add to it when I think of new things. The Bones house was the first house where I tried to ask for a pet dog. I even made a PowerPoint about all the benefits of me having a dog. They didn't even let me finish it. They said, B, B. This is not an option. Why are you always trying to push the boundaries and act out? I cried, but I decided that it was okay. I couldn't have a dog right then because the Bones house was too crowded anyway. I told myself that whatever foster home I was in next, I wouldn't care about anything else except if they let me have a dog. And then I would be happy forever. I don't know if the happy forever part is true, but it was nice to think about when I was living in the Bones house. Back to Mandy and Rick. The problem with the attic is that there isn't really an easy way to eavesdrop from here, and I'm sure they're talking about me right now. I swipe my backpack from the doorknob where I hang it. I'll have to sneak down the wooden stairs, squeaky, ugh, to hear them. And I'm wondering if I should try or just go down and go to the block party. I guess it's worth a try. And if I make too much noise, I'll just pretend I was coming down slowly. I crawl on all fours to the staircase, then crouch on the top step and listen. Mandy said, it's been a few good months. Maybe we should just move forward with trying for an adoption. Maybe that would be the nudge this kid needs. Rick says, let's give it some more time. It can't hurt to wait. I mean, B won't even come to something as small as a block party. What are we doing, you know? There are other kids who might, you know, merge better here. Be a little more grateful. Mandy says, I guess you're right. So many children would die to have what we give this kid. Maybe we're just not the right fit. Rick sighs and my heart drops. See, this is why eavesdropping is important. I don't know if I should even try to go to the block party now, but I'm all ready and I'm just not sure what to do. I think the worst part about stuff like this is how it's going to take a while for them to send me somewhere else and then I'll just have to start over again. Or I'll live in the group home and I hate it there too. One part of me is like, try to win them over and another is like, just give up now, B. I guess this was never gonna work out. Mandy and Rick love going to church and I don't like going at all. It's just so boring. All we do is sit and stand and kneel and sit and stand. I guess maybe I don't hate church. It's just that I just don't like that church. I would like a church if it allowed dogs, I think. Mandy and Rick like to watch TV as a family and I just wanna watch Demon Slayer alone in my room with my headphones on. They wanna go on these family outings to like the zoo and now the block party. I think zoos are sad. I just wanna release all the animals from their cages. Plus, if Rick hates dogs, then why do they wanna to go to the zoo? It makes no sense. Their conversation seems over, so I bound down the stairs and they look startled, but they put on their big, goofy smiles and Mandy says, this will be such a fun day. After hearing what they said, I definitely can't live here for more than a few months. All I can do is try to survive this block party by daydreaming about dogs. When I'm upset, I always imagine what my pet dog would do. Like right now, my pet dog would come up and lick my face to make me feel better. Maybe it would even curl up at my feet. Maybe I should just try to make it on my own. That way, no one could tell me I couldn't have a dog. The last time I tried to run away, I was 10 and I didn't really know anything. This time would be better. Now I'm 12 and I know a lot more about surviving. It seems like it could be a good option. 
at this point. And that is the end of chapter one of Gooseberry. The block party that B and Mandy and Rick are headed to is the block party where B meets Gooseberry. There's a Humane Society booth at the block party and Gooseberry is there. Gooseberry is typically not a very well-behaved dog. They have trouble finding a home for Gooseberry, but Gooseberry seems very attached to B and B decides Gooseberry is their dog. When B finally gets to live with Gooseberry and Erie and Jody, B starts to realize that even having the dog that they wanted and having these parents who are really supportive and loving and they listen and they care, all of that doesn't suddenly make everything easier. And B starts to realize that training a dog is much more difficult than they thought. And sometimes a dog has to adjust to some things before that dog can be trained as well. B and Gooseberry are a really great match for each other. They both have been in a lot of different places. They're both a little bit scared about where they're going and it makes both of them act out because they don't know what to do with their feelings and they don't know who loves them and who cares about them. So Gooseberry and B end up learning a lot from each other. This is a really heartwarming book. It's a great book about finding your voice and finding yourself, but also finding your family and finding the people and animals who love and support you and learning to take care of something else. I really, really loved Gooseberry. It was a great story about this 12 year old kid and their dog and really so much more. So I would highly recommend that you give it a try. That's Gooseberry by Robin Gao. Thank you for joining me.